The title Tenchio Kurao means Devour the World. But when Capcom brought the previous game in this series to the US, they gave it a more bland title, Destiny of an Emperor. And that's why the title translation on the right says Destiny of an Emperor 2, even though this one never came out in the US. The title comes from a comic adaptation of Romance of the Three Kingdoms, the Chinese novel that fictionalized the end of the Han Dynasty, and the civil wars that occurred until the rise of the Jin Dynasty. The comic focuses on the trinity of Liu Bei, Guan Yu, and Zheng Fei, a trio that's placed in the roles of heroes in most adaptations. I should mention at this point that Japanese and English transliterate the names of the characters from the novel differently. They're both a bit far from the original Chinese, but in different ways. To keep things kind of understandable, I'm going with the most common English transliteration, but it is going to be different from what it says on the screen. Capcom proceeded to make two different lines of games based on the comic. A series of arcade beat-em-ups, and a pair of RPGs on the Famicom. Tenchiyo Kurao 2 is not a continuation of the story from the first game. The first game ends with Liu Bei as Emperor of all of China, so continuing that wouldn't work. This game rolls back the clock to the Battle of Shang'an. Liu Super Dong Zhou has been defeated, but Yuan Shao, leader of the alliance against him, has stolen the Imperial Seal and fled. Liu Bei is assigned to pursue him and get it back by Cao Cao future imperial rival, and typically the villain of Three Kingdoms stories. In the first game, I felt like there was a bit of tension between how it tried to represent armies and generals, while fitting that into an RPG-style system. For Tenchiyo Kurao 2, Capcom goes full RPG, and I think it's a better game for that. There's really only two things that carry you over from a strategy game. Your hit points are supposed to be the number of troops you have underneath you, and as that number decreases, the less effective you become in battle. Beyond that, this plays just like Dragon Quest, or maybe closer to Dragon Quest 3. Another big change is that Liu Bei is now the only character that matters. As the story progresses, characters are going to join and leave your army. There's around 40 major characters represented that can join your group, and later on you're able to pick and choose who you want. The key is that everybody levels up with Liu Bei. Let's say you don't want to use Zhao Yun for a little while. Well, if you drop him from your party and then go level up Liu Bei five times, when you bring Zhao Yun back, he's also leveled up five times. The first game had a lot more generals for you to recruit, but they leveled up independently from Liu Bei. And as a result, in the late game, you pretty much had a set party that you'd have to use continuously. You've got a lot more flexibility here, and it's a better game for it. Just because everybody levels up at the same rate doesn't mean that all generals are created equal, though. At the start of the game, Cao Cao assigns Lu Zhao and Zhu Ling to assist you, though you don't have to take them. Guan Yu and Zheng Fei will also join your party immediately, and Sun Cao's men show very little growth when you level up, while your two sworn brothers grow quite a bit. As you might expect, while walking around town, hitting A brings up a menu where you can talk, examine, and use items. A feature that's more important in this game that you might not expect is formation. And here you can assign a character to be your strategist, which means they'll be able to use tactics, which are basically magic in this game. You also set the party order here, and characters at the front tend to get attacked more than characters at the back. The facilities in town are mostly what you'd expect, things like an armor and weapons shop, which outfit you, but not your men, because your men don't matter, and an inn where you recover all of your army by sleeping there for a night. There are a few special facilities to be aware of. There's a gymnasium where you can pay to be leveled up, and a storehouse where you can place items for safekeeping, as well as save your game. When you step outside of town, you'll wander the landscape and get into random encounters. These are reasonably infrequent. I've played a lot of games lately where it's only one or two steps between battles on average, and here it's not uncommon to wander around and explore for 20 or 30 seconds before you encounter another group. Fortunately, you also level up fast by defeating them. In battle, it's the usual options of attack, defend, use an item, or run away. 
The first character can also be given an order for an all-out assault, which is just an auto battle where people randomly attack whoever they like. You might not want to do that, though, because enemies with more troops hit harder. Most of the rest of what you'll find is fairly standard RPG stuff. There are dungeons, for some reason. You know, just you and 1,200 of your closest friends exploring a cave and opening treasure chests. You'll have encounters with major generals at some locations. At the very end of the hour I was playing, I got to Yuan Chao and defeated him. So progress was really quick here. In Japan, Tenchio Korao 2 is really well regarded. A fair number of people put this among the top Famicom RPGs. People were quite disappointed when a sequel that was promised by the ending never materialized. Because of the limited time I have to play games for Fami Daily, one of the big things I notice in RPGs is whether or not they're easy to get into. And Tenchio Korao 2 is really approachable. It also really takes advantage of its theme, and it plays a lot faster than many Famicom RPGs. This is one that I want to get back to.